introduce. Okay, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Um, welcome to another lockdown lecture with Harif. Harif, uh, as you know, is the UK Association of Jews from the Middle East and North Africa. We are five volunteers based in England and we aim to raise awareness of the history and culture of these Jews. Uh, do check out our website www.harif.org. Uh, subscribe to our mailing list if you're not there already and our associated blog, Point of No Return, uh, updated daily. Well, this evening, we are delighted to have with us Ben Uthwaite, who will be telling us all about the Cairo Geniza. Uh, as you know, the Geniza is a collection of some 400,000 uh, Jewish manuscript fragments and other documents that were found in the storeroom of the Ben Ezra synagogue in Old Cairo in Egypt. And here to talk us through the, some of these documents uh, is Ben and he is the head of the Geniza unit at Cambridge University. So over to you Ben. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, so my talk will be entirely slide based. Um, so you briefly see me here and then I'm just going to disappear and you won't see me again. Um, just to say apologies if my internet connection occasionally lags or stutters. Um, it just seems to be what it does whenever I have to lecture over Zoom and there's no avoiding it. But anyway, um, uh, let me just find for one second. I'm just having trouble now finding my, my keynote. Are you seeing my... Just seeing your face at the moment, Ben. Yeah, um, it's slightly... Yeah, yeah, we're on. Ah, we're on. Are you seeing my slides now? Yes, yeah. we are. So if I click, you see the change in slide. Yes. Good. Okay. Ready to um, go. So I'm going to be talking for about 45 minutes about the Cairo Geniza. I think when I originally sat down and sort of put together this PowerPoint, I thought that. I would do it a bit like, you know, the history of the world in sort of a hundred objects. I would take 20 manuscripts and talk about them for 45 minutes uh, and, and not give a sort of standard narrative of this is the Cairo Geniza, it was discovered by Solomon Schechter and do it that way. Um, of course, I didn't stick to that because it's impossible when you start doing that. There are too many interesting manuscripts in the Cairo Geniza. This is the main problem. Um, in Cambridge alone, there are about 200,000 manuscripts. There are another 200,000, maybe even more, scattered around the world. And just to pick out, you know, just a small handful uh, to talk about is, is impossible. And at the same time, you also want people to know, uh, really, about the way the collection was dis discovered, because that in itself is a, is a fascinating story. Um, however, I think I've hit a kind of happy medium and that I will show you enough that you get a good sense of what some of the most interesting things are in the Karaganiza. Although again, it's a very personal view from, from me and my interests are sort of quite focused on, on a particular period in time and particular types of manuscripts and the Geniza covers a thousand years of Jewish history. There are manuscripts there, are, well, I mean, it's even 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 greater period than that. There are manuscripts that date as early as the fourth or fifth century CE, all the way up to the end of the nineteenth century. Um, but the great majority of material falls uh, in the eleventh and twelfth centuries, when there was a very large, vibrant Jewish community uh, centered on the Ben Ezra synagogue. It wasn't called that then in those days, but the the synagogue of the it was the Kanisat Hashami'in, 
the, the, the synagogue of the, of the Syrians, of the Palestinians, in Fustat, in Old Cairo. Um, it's a, a community that uh, absorbed Jews from across the uh, Middle East, from North Africa, from Spain. People like Moses Maimonides ended up there and so on. And little bits of all of these different Jewish cultures end up in the Cairo Geniza. So it really is, it, 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 it's, it's an amazing window um, on a particular place and point in time, that is to say uh, uh, Jewish Egypt in the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries mainly, but all the way up through the Ottoman period as well. But it also captures little bits of the whole Jewish world throughout the Middle Ages and early modern period. So there are bits there from Spain, from south of France, from North Africa, from the whole Jewish world as it then was. Now, the quote I have on, on uh, the screen now is from Simon Sharma, his recent, um, well, recent, it's a few years ago now, TV series, uh, The Story of the Jews, he came to visit the Kogeniza. He spent a day there. He he did some filming. Uh, we ended up in you know quite a good segment in his in his one episode of his documentary, um, and in return he gave us an excellent quote, which I've used ever since and will continue forever to use, which is the Kogeniza is the single most complete archive of a society anywhere in the whole medieval world. Um, you cannot really argue with that, um, and you certainly can't because I'm speaking in that. So, you know, it's, the fact is that the Cairo Geniza is quite, it, it's for a start, you can argue with one fact, it is not an archive, it is not an organized collection. But once you get over that slight, you know, obvious fact, the rest of it is clear. There is nothing else quite like it because it is an accidental collection of material. It wasn't any one person's or one organization's view of what should be collected. It's just stuff that happened to tumble into a storeroom and was kept for a thousand years. Now, it came to Cambridge and really came to the world's attention thanks to Solomon Schechter. Solomon Schechter was a, um, a Chabadnik originally from Eastern Europe. Uh, he came uh, to teach Hebrew and teach rabbinics in Cambridge. Uh, he was there um, in the late 19th century. And it was brought to his attention that there was a great store of manuscripts in Cairo, in an old synagogue, in a Geniza, in a storeroom in Cairo. And he brought it back to Cambridge, or he brought a large proportion of it back to Cambridge. And he wrote an article in the Times uh, explaining what he had done. And this article was published in 1897, following his return to Cambridge with this, this treasure trove that he had got. And in it, it's still one of the best explanations of what a Geniza is. It was called A Horde of Hebrew Manuscripts by Dr. S. Schechter. And I'll just read this um, beginning of his article here. Uh, the Geniza, to explore which was the object of my late travels in the East, is an old Jewish institution. The word is derived from the Hebrew verb ganaz. The word appears in the book of Esther, where it, it refers to treasuries and storehouses, and signifies treasure house or hiding place. When applied to books, it means much the same thing as burial means in the case of men. When the spirit is gone, we put the corpse out of sight to protect it from abuse. In like manner, when the writing is worn out, we hide the book to preserve it from profanation the contents of the book go up to heaven like the soul. So it's quite, a, it's quite an eloquent, he was an extremely eloquent man, given especially that English was about his sort of 10th language. Um, it's a very eloquent explanation of what um, Jewish tradition regards, you know, the, as the correct treatment of holy writings, of sacred books. Um, they are spiritually a bit like people Books, once they are dead, you must look after them, preserve them from being profaned. You must put them somewhere safe. And that's the purpose of a Geniza. Now, Solomon Schechter, following a trail of a manuscript that he'd been shown in Cambridge, ended up in Cairo. He knew that there was an old synagogue in Cairo and he knew it had a Geniza because there were book dealers in Jerusalem who were getting manuscripts in there and selling them on the open market. And this is in the late 19th century. And so he made, uh, he made a trip, um, having borrowed money from someone in Cambridge, he made a trip to Cairo. He met the chief rabbi of Egypt. The chief rabbi took him um, to old Cairo. So you see here in the middle here is the, um, this is what used to be the fortress of Babylon. This is Fustat, which is now in the center. It's, it's Coptic Cairo, old Cairo in Egypt. Um, and it's originally a Roman fortress. You can see the round towers of the, the of the, of the original, well, it was a port because it was a tributary of the Nile. Uh, uh, there was a canal built there. 
and a city grew up around it. And when the uh, Muslims conquered uh, Egypt, they made it their first capital for stuff. Um, and soon after that, Jews settled there and they built a synagogue. And the synagogue was the um, believed to be one of the oldest in Egypt um, that was in, in, still in use. And the synagogue is, is here. And it's now known as the Ben Ezra Synagogue, a name which it acquired probably in the uh, Ottoman period, so in the 16th or 17th century. But originally, as I said, it was the Kanisa Tashami in, in Arabic, the, the synagogue of the Palestinian Jews. And there were two synagogues in Fustat, in this old part of the city. There were two synagogues, one for the Palestinian Jews, so the Jews who recognized the primacy of Jerusalem, of Palestine, who either they themselves came from Palestine or their ancestors had you know, recently come from Palestine. And then there was the synagogue of the Iraqi, of the Iraqis, of the Babylonian Jews, who recognized Baghdad as their spiritual center. And that was a little bit removed from this synagogue. So there were two main synagogues there. So the Jewish community was essentially split in two in Old Cairo. Um, that's the Ben Ezra synagogue. And Solomon Schechter was shown into it by the chief rabbi, and he was shown a storeroom in there, which was two stories high, and invited to jump down through a hole in the wall and, and into the room. And he landed, as he said, on, on sort of a thousand years of Jewish culture beneath his feet. The manuscripts groaned and, 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 and cracked, and he decided to carry it back to Cambridge. Now, he came because he had been shown by um, one of two Scottish sisters in Cambridge, adventurers who had made a trip to Cairo, who had bought manuscripts, and their story is told in a lovely book by Janet Soskis called Sisters of Sinai. They were Victorian adventurous women who, who went to monasteries to recover um, manuscripts of the Bible. And in traveling through Cairo, they had bought manuscripts and not knowing quite what they had bought in some cases. They were scholarly women who read all sorts of um, ancient languages, but they didn't recognize this particular text, which they showed to Solomon Schechter. And as I've got there on my screen, you can see this is, um, it's a paper manuscript, so you can see uh, it's aged particularly badly. It's been affected by damp, and the damp has caused the ink. Uh, the ink is an iron gall ink, has iron in it. The ink has oxidized, has, has, has um, essentially rotted through the paper. Um, so the, the manuscript itself is probably not older than a thousand years old, because paper doesn't really arrive in Egypt until the 10th century. Um, but the text in which, in which it preserves, which Solomon Schechter recognized on being shown this manuscript by um, one of these two Scottish sisters here, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Lewis and Mrs. Gibson, um, he recognized it as a lost Jewish book, the book of Ben Sirah, Sefer Ben Sirah, um, that had not really been seen since about the 10th or 11th century. It was a book that was well known in Christian circles. There were translations into other languages, Christian languages, Greek and Georgian and things like that. But the Hebrew version of it had been lost in the Jewish tradition. And it was only when Schechter was shown this in Cambridge that he realized he was the first person to see the Hebrew version of it since about the 10th or 11th century when Sadia Gaon and Hai Gaon in Babylon had last um, written about the book. So he was determined, you know, this was an amazing discovery in and of itself. This was, this was a career making discovery, but he wanted, uh, this is one page of what would have been a whole book. So he wanted more. So he took off to Egypt. He met the chief rabbi. He discovered where this manuscript came from. And uh, the rest is, is history. He brought the Cairo Geniza back to Cambridge. When he was first shown this manuscript, he wrote this letter, which I've reproduced really small here. So you probably can't read it. Um, it's, it's dated the 13th of May, 1896, written on University Library headed note paper. Dear Mrs. Lewis, I think we have reason co to congratulate ourselves. But the fragment I took with me represents a piece of the original Hebrew of Ecclesiasticus. That's the Christian name for the book of Ben Sira. And he was talking to two Christian women, so obviously he was using those terms. It is the first time that such a thing was discovered. Please do not speak yet about the matter till tomorrow. I'll come to you tomorrow about 11 p.m. and talk over the matter with you in how to make the matter known. In haste and great excitement, yours sincerely, S. Schechter. And we always remark that he is so excited that he agrees to meet um, two widowed sisters at 11 p.m. at night in, in, in uh, uh, Victorian Cambridge. Extremely unusual. Um, he's probably made a mistake. He probably meant a.m. Now, when he went to the synagogue and he was shown this storeroom, he knew he was looking at the Geniza of the synagogue, so the sacred storeroom. But what is a Geniza? Um, well, the laws of Geniza are set out here in a Geniza manuscript. This is a, uh, a manuscript of, Mishnah, of the Mishnah, uh, 
So, you know, one of the, the, the central books of, of uh, law books of Judaism, it's Mishnah Shabbat saying what you can and cannot do on the Sabbath. And as you know, um, there are many things you can't do, but there are some things that you must do, no matter whether it is, is a Sabbath or not. And one of those is saving life. Now, equivalent to saving life, it actually says, Kol kitvei ha-kodesh matzalim otam mipnei hadleka, ve'en she'korim bahem u've'en she'enan korim bahem, afal pi k'tuvim b'chol l'shon u'teonim k'niza. So, all holy writings must be saved from fire, from destruction, whether you read them, or not, and no, um, no matter what language they're in, um, they should be subject to the law of Geniza. So this is a, a requirement equivalent to saving life. On the Sabbath, it is your duty to save holy books from destruction. Now, it doesn't actually say what holiness, what a holy book is, um, and that is one of the reasons, perhaps, that we have the Cairo Geniza, because it was not clearly defined what should be saved. They ended up saving everything. Now, if you look at this, if you look at the, um, the edge of this manuscript, you can see it's written on parchment. So it's written on sheepskin in this case. You can see in this picture the, the hair follicles from the sheep. And what you can also note here is um, that the you know animals are irregularly shaped and their skin is often irregular once it's treated and stretched and so on and you can see here that this is a, a lovely book of the Mishnah but the piece of skin on which it's written was misshapen and the scribe has simply just written around the edge of it this is not damage that was done after the writing of the book you can see that the The lines end sort of writing on anatomy in the 9th, 10th centuries when this book was written, um, you had to make do with an imperfect writing material. Um, apologies if I'm stuttering now, but I've just got a message that my internet connection is unstable. Now, oh, Ben, perhaps if you go, you, 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 you turn your camera off and we just hear your voice, that might work. Um, it's okay, leave, it, leave him on. <laughs> I think is, it was. Is it, it, is it stuttering very badly? No, no, it isn't. It isn't. I think just carry on. Okay, okay. Um, so the sorts of holy books that you would expect to find and the sorts of things that Solomon Schechter found in great abundance are like this. This is a Bible. This is a beautiful Bible. Um, you can see the micrography, yes, the, the, the tiny um, uh, decorations which are, are formed from the words of the Masara in this Bible, making a decoration around the outside of what is the beginning of Genesis. Bereshit, Elohim, it's a Shemaim Betaharetz. Um, now, there is no doubt, you know, that no one would argue that this is a holy book. It is the holy book. Um, you should preserve this, not only because it's holy, it, it has God's name throughout the Tetragrammaton, the Shem HaShem is written, you know, uh, however many times it occurs in the Bible, uh, thousands of times. Um, but it's written in the holy language, which is the, 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 um, the Shon HaKodesh that God chose to transmit the Torah in. And the book itself is an expensive valued book you wouldn't want to once it comes to the end of its natural life you wouldn't want to throw it away you would want to keep it um so this book ends up in the Geniza and Solomon Schechter recovers it entirely as you would expect but what about something like this so this is a child's version of the it appears to be a, a list of the um of 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 the readings um, beginning with Genesis 1-1 of, 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 of the readings of the, of the cycle of, of reading the Torah. So Barashit Bara Elohim, again, um, a very different affair. It's um, you know, poorly written by anyone's standard. It's written on paper, not on animal skin. Um, but still, it is a holy book. It has God's name in it. Uh, if you can see Elohim and Shem HaShem and so on. Um, therefore, once you put those things down on paper, you should not treat mistreats that piece of paper it still has to be preserved and so Solomon Schechter was slightly surprised I think at the sorts of things that turned up in the collection like that and then when you get to things like this this extends the idea of what sacred writings even more so this is this is an obvious um, uh, trick question but if I tell you that one of these is the Quran and one of them is the Bible um, you would know that um, I, it's a trick question and therefore the one on the right must be the Bible and the one on the left must be the Quran and you'd be right 
<laughs> even though the one on the left is clearly written in Hebrew characters and the one on the right is clearly written in Arabic characters, yeah. which is the wrong way round for those two sacred books. But in actual fact, um, if you read the very first two words there of the, the fragment on the left, you can see it says Fatiha al Qatab. Um, so this is the first chapter of the Quran, the first surah of the Quran, which is in seven verses. And if you read underneath it, you see um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah. I mean, it's Arabic. It's just written in Hebrew characters, which we call Judeo-Arabic, you know, the, the, like Yiddish. I mean, many of you will be familiar with this anyway, um, but this being Kharif, but, but um, the, the writing of your spoken vernacular language in Hebrew characters <coughs> is a, something that we find across the whole Jewish world. So here you have the Quran on the left, not entirely clear why it's written in Hebrew characters. Um, it's possible it was being used um, for magical purposes. Perhaps a Jew was using the Quran as a kind of charm. Um, it, was a, it, was not, uh, it, it was forbidden for Jews to copy the Quran in the Middle Ages. It was against the, the, the agreement of the Dhimmi um, that they would that they would copy the, uh, the Quran and would be met with strict uh, harsh penalties if they were caught doing it. So perhaps that's why it's written in Hebrew characters. On the other hand, it could be a Jew who's converted to Islam but hasn't learned how to write the Arabic script. Um, it's not entirely clear why. Now the other fragment, if you now you can't read the Arabic there. I mean, I can't I can't really read the Arabic there at all. But uh, you have to take my word for it that it says Ototaya Shea Siti Bemitzrayim. Uh, or Vemitzrayim, um, which is Numbers, um, the book of Numbers from the Bible. So this is actually um, the book of Numbers um, written in Arabic characters, but if you look at the dots and the dashes, you will obviously see the usual dots and dashes that you get with Arabic indicating one consonant over another, but if you look closer you'll see there are lots of Hebrew vowels in there, and that's because this is a copy of the um, Bible produced by a Karaite Jew, um, who the Karaites in the Middle Ages, this hardline sect of Judaism that placed the Bible at the center of their entire worldview and their law, they rejected the rabbinic teachings, they re rejected the oral Torah for the most part, and they, they, you know, all of their laws and beliefs were derived from the Bible, and one of those aspects of it is that they wanted to pronounce uh, and recite the Bible as accurately as possible. And one of the ways they thought they could do that would be by copying it out um, and recording the correct pronunciation in Arabic characters because Arabic had more nuance in it than Hebrew. Hebrew was more opaque for the correct pronunciation of the Bible. So these two books turn up in the Geniza. So um, surprising perhaps that you find a copy of the Quran and a copy of the Bible written in Arabic characters to be used by Jews, but on the other hand, unequivocally sacred books. Um, but you also get things that, you know, clearly have no sacred character at all, or, or quite a tenuous sacred character. So this is a paper fragment. Um, it's very nicely preserved, even though it is at probably at least a thousand years old. Um, you, it's entirely written in Hebrew, which is interesting because it's a communication between, uh, from one man, Aaron, you see his name written at the bottom, Aaron HaKohen Afbet Din Barabi. So Aaron the Cohen, um, who is the second in command of the, uh, of the community, um, who is the son of, and then he doesn't give his father's name because he's so well known he doesn't need to give it. And he is inviting a man, and if you see on the fourth line there, you'll see, um, Marana Suwaid Hazaken Hatov, Uvanab, and his sons, his two sons, Sadia and Yahya. And he is inviting Suwaid, Sadia and Yahya, so they all have Arabic names, but they are Jews because he's writing to them in, in Hebrew. Um, so he is inviting you, um, your honours, to come tomorrow on the Sabbath, um, on Shabbat, and to join with the elders, uh, God bless them, God protect them, and to hear words of Torah, so to hear a sermon. So it's an invitation to come and hear the sermon in the synagogue, the sort of extended sermon. And we know that the sermon was an important uh, social event in, in the Jewish life of, in medieval, of medieval Egypt, 
but it was also an important financial event for the people giving the sermon. We know that um, a man called Elkanan ben Shemaria, um, for instance, gave a sermon, a sermon and received 100 dirhams, so 100 silver coins, uh, for giving it and in the collection afterwards. So it's an important event. And what's most interesting about this is that the message is written in Hebrew. Even though it's written by a man who is um, almost certainly Arabic speaking, and he's writing it to um, a man and his two sons who are definitely Arabic speaking because they all have Arabic names, yet nevertheless he writes in Hebrew. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why this gets placed into the Geniza. Now, it doesn't have the Shem Hashem in the sacred name of God, but it has um, Hadzur, Tzuram, yeah? um, a name of God, or perhaps just because it's written in Hebrew characters that makes it uh, sacred. But whatever the reason is, it ends up there. And this is why the Geniza is so unique, because you will not find other collections um, that, that have retained so much ephemera, so much throwaway material from the Middle Ages. Um, for a start, in Europe, you wouldn't get communications like this because they didn't have paper at that time. They only had parchment, and parchment was more expensive. Um, paper, you know, reaches Egypt and the Jews of Egypt through the Islamic world from China, and they get it centuries before it arrives um, in Europe uh, in, in, great, in great abundance. And so it was possible in the Islamic world to write notes like this that in Europe might have had to be scribbled on some other much more expensive piece of uh, piece of writing material. And in addition, most Jews, it appears in this period, were literate, that they were able to write. And the reason they were able to write was because of the requirement that all Jews be able to read the Bible, to read the Torah. And the way they taught reading was to make them copy out um, the Bible and thus they learned how to write Hebrew. Now, if you look here, this is paper. You can see, if you look at the, the, the top left-hand corner there, you can see that it's layers. Um, the paper that you get in the Geniza is actually made of um, uh, textiles. So it's, it's, it's sort of old clothes that are pulped and treated like wood pulp and glued together and pressed in a mold. And that makes the paper very, very strong and resilient. So it's, 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 a, it's a linen, uh, linen, flax and various other textiles in there. And that's helped it to last a thousand years, which is another fortunate thing about the Cairo Geniza. Now, we know about children learning how to write Hebrew because, again, um, in great numbers, we have their manuscripts preserved in the collection. So here is a, this is um, the book of Leviticus, a bit of it, but there's also Baruch uh, Adonai Le'olam, Amen Ve Amen, there's some blessings, and there's on the back of it, there's sort of other exercises. This is a book for copying Hebrew. So this is a model um, to be used by a school child for copying. And the great thing about the Geniza is we not only have these models, but we also have the things that the children produce. So if you look at the text on the left, which is Leviticus um, 5.15, I think. So it's the, um, the, um, the ram without blemish that you have to give for your sins. You can see that the child on the right has written the same text. Um, but if you're, if, you're, if you're good with Tiberian vowels, you'll notice that a lot of the vowels are what, you know, not correct. Um, A's and E's are mixed up in particular, which was, was, was quite common with Arabic speaking Jews. Um, but you'll also note that uh, they don't write the Shem HaShem in full. So you'll see on the fourth line there, you've got Lifnei Adonai, but Adonai is written as three yuds. And that's because in children's books and so on, they, 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 they did not like to write the full name of God. But nevertheless, they preserved the text in the Geniza as if it were a sacred book. And some of the books are beautiful. This is a children's book from 10th or 11th century, probably from a high status school or, you know, it's, a, it's a, a rich child's book for learning Hebrew. It's a beautiful, wonderful, illuminated book. And we have huge numbers of them. Uh, further pages, you know, teaching here, not only how to write the consonants, but how to write the vowels of Hebrew. And you can see that a student has written them all out. Now, this they did this so that they could learn how to read the Torah. That was the purpose. The purpose was not to teach Jews how to write Hebrew. It was to teach them how to read the Torah. But the outcome was that they could write Hebrew at the end of it. They could know how to write and um, you know, they, 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 they learned how to copy out vast parts of the, of, the, of the Bible, of the book of Leviticus in particular, meant that they, they, were, they were thoroughly familiar with Hebrew. And so when it came to writing letters later in life, even if they decided to write them in Arabic,
they wrote them in Arabic in Hebrew characters because Hebrew characters was the language that they had been taught. Many of them had not learned how to write Arabic script. Now in this case, um, some of you will recognize this letter, it's quite famous. This man did know how to write Arabic script, but when communicating with fellow Jews um, who were Arabic speaking, he preferred to write in Hebrew characters. And again, if you read it, you say, Atala Lau, it's Arabic at the beginning, but in Hebrew characters. And he's writing to a man called Ashaykha Thikha, you can see there at the end of the first line, um, the faithful Sheikh. And this is a letter, and if you look at, um, the signature you see, Moshe Barabi Maimun. So this is the Maimonides letter. This is the first time in the Geniza that we found um, Moses Maimonides' name in full at the end of a letter that he had written. Um, to be expected, he lived in Egypt. He moved to Egypt, you know, in the, in the 1160s. He lived in Fustat. Um, and his documents turn up in, in great number in the Cairo Geniza. And it's thanks to this letter, which was discovered quite early on, I think, in the 19th, 40s or 50s, um, that we recognized his peculiar handwriting because he was a Spanish Jew in Egypt at the time when there weren't that many Spanish Jews. So he has this interesting way of writing. You see the Moshe there with the final hay, which is all loot. And um, this is signature Moshe Berabi Maimun Zatzal, so that the Zechad Tzadikim Lefacha for his father. His father Maimun is dead at this stage. Um, and because we recognize his name there, we can see it when it's written all over the Geniza. So this is a she'ela. So this is a question, uh, asking a question of Jewish law about whether a man can marry his nephew's um, uh, uh, wife, um, his, his late nephew's wife. Um, and you can see at the bottom there that the answer, al-jawab, the answer in Arabic is written again, Arabic in Hebrew characters, but you can see at the end of it, Wakataba or Vechatav, it's the same in Hebrew or in Arabic, Moshe. And you can see the Moshe is the same as the Moshe Berabi Maimon. So this is a, a tshuva, a, a responsum, written by Moses Maimonides. And it's preserved in the Cairo Geniza. And we have a number of these responsa written by Maimonides, answers, you know, his rulings on Jewish law, or his opinions on Jewish law, which were not published in any other form. They just somehow ended up in the Geniza. Perhaps his personal papers got put into the Geniza. They were never published in his lifetime. And his handwriting turns up all over. This is uh, his, his, his own draft, one of his drafts of his, um, his most famous work of philosophy, um, Dalela Dal Hayrin, the Guide for the Perplexed. Again, you should by now be able to recognize his peculiar Spanish, Arabic, Hebrew handwriting. Um, he was also you know, quite a messy writer. Um, this is a page of his, his copy of the Mishneh Torah, so his, his codification of Jewish law. This is the title page of Hilchot Nizkei Mamon, except you can see that the original um, title was Hilchot Nizikim, which he's crossed out and replaced with Nizkei Mamon. And the words underneath it are Hebrew, yesh, bitklalan, but his handwriting is really difficult to read. And this is a lost work of Maimonides that he never published, but ended up in the Geniza. It's a work of his youth. Um, his, it's his, um, his collection of the Halachot from the Talmud Yerushalmi, um, which we knew he wrote, but he never published. Um, and leaves of his own copy of it turn up in the Geniza. He probably never completed the book, which is why he never published it. And it's not just Maimonides himself, because he, he, he headed the Jewish community in the 12th century. Um, following his death, he established a dynasty. His son took over. And, you know, down the ages, his grandchildren um, continued to be prominent members of the Jewish community in Egypt. And this is um, an announcement. Well, it's, it's, it's a list of books that are being sold. We have many of these in the collection. Um, books were such a vital part of Jewish life that when somebody died, the first thing they would do would be to itemize their library and then to make sure that it was sold to people within the Jewish community, you know, retain the books within the community, retain the knowledge within the community. And so this book notes that there is a, um, this page notes that there is a book sale and it's, the date is given the third day. So um, the third day of the 26th of the month of Adar in the year. And that year is Alishtarot year, which equates to 1223. Um, and then it's short for Yerushalmi'in. So the Jerusalemite synagogue, which is the same as the Syrian or Palestinian synagogue. So this is the Ben Ezra synagogue. Um, in the presence of Adonenu, Nagideinu, Avraham, Hanagid. So in the presence of 
our Lord, the Nagid, the Prince, Abraham. And this is Abraham Maimonides. So this is um, Moses Maimonides' son. And that they will be selling Masahif Ibrani or Arabi. Um, so they will be selling um, books in Arabic and in Hebrew, in Hebrew and in Arabic, in the presence of, Mo of, of Moses Maimonides' son. And the handwriting of Abraham Maimonides turns up as well. Now, Abraham um, has a, a similar handwriting to his father, um, but distinctive of his own, and you can see it. You can see the way he writes Moshe there, so Avraham Barabi Moshe, and Zatzal again. So, so this is after Moses Maimonides is dead. His son has taken over as head of the community. And he proved to be a divisive figure. Now, one of the things that Moses Maimonides um, says in the Mishneh Torah, when he arrived in Egypt, um, he was a Spanish Jew. He had settled in North Africa originally. He had then had to leave North Africa because of the um, persecution there. He'd gone to try and settle in the land of Israel, but that was not possible. So he had um, ended up in Egypt uh, where he shot to fame. It was the making of him, became the head of the community. He became a physician to the Caliph's court, to the Sultan's court. And generally, you know, he established his reputation throughout the, 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 the Arabic speaking Jewish world and then beyond. Um, but when he arrived in Egypt as this kind of um, urbane, civilized Spaniard, he felt that the Egyptian Jews were backward. And he said as much. Um, Egypt had once been a great center of Jewish knowledge, but it had, it had suffered. And it had suffered because of the wars, the Crusades, the decline, you know, the, the decline of the land of Israel, which had given Egypt much of its vitality. Um, when, when the Jews were forced out by the, the Seljuks and the Crusaders, Egypt became less important. It was no longer the gateway to Palestine, the gateway to Jerusalem it had been. And it no longer had the great names associated with it, the great, the great scholars that it had once had. And so he felt that it was backward and that they needed improving. So they didn't you know, quite say the, the prayers properly. They didn't, they didn't use the mikveh often enough. Um, and they didn't write the mezuzah properly. Now, so the mezuzah, as you know, is the, one of the oldest forms of Jewish, of Jewish um, it's an amulet, really. It's an amulet that the Bible says you must put on your doorposts. And it has two verses, uh, two bits from the, the book of Deuteronomy. And it, it, that's already established in the Bible, exactly how you should write it. And that continues unchanged down the centuries. And it's very strict the way you should write it. But Maimonides points out in his Mishneh Torah there are those who write in them the names of angels or holy names or biblical verses or sort of special signs. They, among the, they are among those who will not have a part in the world to come. Um, so he is accusing people of, of basically um, using magic on, on a religious artifact, um, trying to increase its power through the use of angels' names and things like that. Now, you could just say that this was Maimonides, you know, erecting a, a kind of a straw man. To, but in actual fact, sure enough, in the Cairo Geniza, we find examples of exactly what he's criticizing. And again, it's odd in a way that they should be preserved because these are strictly forbidden by rabbinic law and by Moses Maimonides. People who write these have no part in the world to come. And yet they are preserved in the Geniza because they are still holy items. A mezuzah is still a holy item, even if you do write angels' names and special signs all over it. So you can see here this one. So the form of the mezuzah is exactly as according to the halakha, um, except once you get to the end of the um, selected verses of Deuteronomy, it's got ya, 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 and then it's got magen davids, and then it has the names of angels down the side. So Azriel and, and Uriel and Gavriel and things like that. So somebody has decided that the mezuzah is not quite powerful enough to protect the house, and they've added religious, uh, they've added further magical power to it. And if you think that's just a one-off, then we have more of them in the Geniza, and you can see that Maimonides was railing against a very, a very widespread custom amongst Egyptian Jews, uh, and a further one. And the thing, and you see at the bottom of this one, ya, 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 and all the Magen Davids. And the thing to remember at this time is the Magen David is not a Jewish symbol specifically. It is a magical symbol used by all the religions. It only later on probably becomes a, a specifically Jewish symbol. Um, and from, from producing a more powerful mezuzah, it's only um, a short 
distance to writing your own amulet. So this is for a man and his wife that um, one, they will be protected, but two, he will find favor in the eyes of his wife. Um, and you can see there all the magical symbols. And it's an enormous great long amulet that would have been rolled up and carried in a container. And here to preserve someone from being bitten by scorpions, presumably a danger in Egypt, um, they, this, this the magician has mass produced these amulets and you can see the drawings of scorpions on them all. The interesting thing is they're written in Hebrew. They call upon a Babylonian rabbi to excommunicate the scorpion, a powerful Babylonian rabbi, but the name of the, of, uh, the magical name that they use for their power is Aphrodite. So it's, it's, it's a Jewish amulet that calls on Aphrodite to protect you from scorpions. And from there, um, you get the dark arts. Uh, so here, again, preserved in the Guinea. So even though this is strictly forbidden by every book of Jewish law, if you read this, it's written in a mixture of Hebrew, Aramaic, and Judeo-Arabic, and Arabic, which is the, the usual way that, that magicians decided to, to make their art more arcane, was to mix lots of languages. Um, you can see it says, take a plate of lead and write on it in the first hour of the day, you write a name on it. Bury it in a new grave, which is three days old. And at the very end of it, in Arabic script, um, which is not part of the incantation, it's a kind of instruction to the magician. It says, this is very effective for killing. So this is a spell for how to kill people. You write their name on, a, on, on lead and you bury it in a graveyard. Um, now, while Maimonides might have uh, complained about the Jewish community, there were many aspects uh, um, in which the Egyptian Jews were extremely advanced. And one way that they showed this was in their treatment of social affairs. So on the left, you have a get, which is a divorce deed. And it is a standard thing. The get is one of the oldest forms of, the Jew of Jewish document, like the ketubah. The marriage has been around forever. And the ketubah is written in Aramaic. Um, so is the get. And the get doesn't really change. The only thing that differs about the get is the date, the place where it was written, and the names of the parties. The rest of it is very, very standard. This one was written in Cairo, or Cairo, um, in the, uh, I think, the 11th or 12th century, I can't remember. Um, but there was a problem in Egypt, uh, mainly in the 12th century onwards, when Egyptian Jews started um, to make their living not by trading in the Mediterranean, which was not possible after the end of the 11th century because of the Crusaders and the Italian city-states. The Christians dominated the Mediterranean. So Jews more and more started trading with India and the East. And so they went down the Red Sea and they crossed the Indian Ocean. But the difference between that and trading in the Mediterranean along the North African coast was it was much more dangerous. And consequently, um, Jewish merchants would go off and disappear and never be seen again. And that was a problem in Jewish law because uh, if you are married or even if you're betrothed and your husband or uh, betrothed disappears, unless you have male witnesses who saw him dead, um, you remain married to him forever. Um, you, you are an aguna. And the, the particular danger of the Indian Ocean voyage was that, that, you know, whole ships would sink in the stormy Indian Ocean and there would be no witnesses left. And so uh, you would be a, a, a living widow in Egypt with no, with no way of, of, of escaping from this situation. And the rabbis in Egypt took this into account and they produced um, a special kind of divorce deed. And there's an example here on the right, and you can see this one's written on paper. Um, and it actually says, um, that basically if um, the husband is believed to be dead then this will be a divorce deed and if he isn't believed to be dead then it will not be a divorce deed. Um, so essentially it's, it's a divorce which is allowed where there is a case of um, doubt and this would be given to the wife before the man took off on a voyage and should he not come back within a set period of time so if he didn't come back within five years which is how long it might take say you know to make the voyage and to make his fortune then she could use this to obtain a divorce even though there were no witnesses and no evidence that he was dead and we have accounts of these being used and there's also accounts there's a response of a, of a woman who has one of these and it's uh, i think due to be enacted within a certain time period say seven years and it comes down to a few days before the period of time ends when her husband turns up in the city and she hides in the city so that she no longer um that she can so she can wait the last few days for her divorce deed to become to become active and she can divorce him 
And similarly, because they were trading across large distances and because traveling with large amounts of money was dangerous, um, they came up with paper money too. So um, transactions wouldn't be conducted um, at long distances with gold and silver. Instead, they'd be conducted with paper money. And if you read them, and these are written in, in a variety of different languages, Aramaic, Hebrew, Aramaic, um, Arabic, all mixed together, Judeo-Arabic. But if you read it, it says, Yafar Sheikh. Abu al khiyah so may the may the, the, the Sheikh Abu al khiyah who was the banker, pay um, uh, to, to the bearer of this note for wax, so for wax candle, candles, five dinars, and it's dated um, in the 12th century, and it's written by a Jewish merchant who is famous for trading of India, Abu Zikri Kohen. Um, and the, the amount of of numbers, uh, the amount of um, money is written both in words, um, um, but also in a number at the top, in a Coptic Arabic numeral at the top. So um, just like a modern check, you write out the amount twice to make sure there's no confusion, um, it pays to the bearer, it's remarkably similar. And this is already from the 12th century and most of the, I mean, most banking history is thought to have come from later on in the Italians, in the Italian banking states in, 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 in the sort of uh, 13, 14 centuries. Right, I'm coming close to the end of my talk now. So just to say a few other things. One of the things that Maimonides in particular wanted to change when he arrived in Egypt was he felt that there were too many customs and that, they, um, it, that really there was one orthodoxy and he would impose it. Now he didn't, he wasn't successful in this in his lifetime, but his son took up the mantle and tried to stamp out some of the, the the alternate customs that were going on in Egypt. And many of them are associated with the synagogue of the Palestinians. And for a while, the synagogue of the Palestinians took a kind of bogeyman role in the, in the Jewish community, and as Maimonides and his son fought against it. Um, and the reason was that the synagogue of the Palestinians, and this is why the Geniza is so important, um, they, were, they, were, they had customs and traditions, old customs and traditions that were lost, uh, that had been lost. Um, in the wider Jewish world, and that were only really rediscovered when Shechter rediscovered the Cairo Geniza. And so one of them was the fact that they didn't read the Torah through in one year. They read it through in three or three and a half years. So the dominant custom today is obviously to read the whole Torah through in one year and then to celebrate with Simchat Torah. They didn't do that in a Palestinian synagogue. They carried on an older custom from Eretz Israel where they read it in three or three and a half years. Um, they had to give up that custom eventually but they were still doing it, it seems, um, in, in Ottoman times, um, despite my mom Dizan and his son's best efforts. Now, the other one was that they had their own reading of the Passover Haggadah with five questions instead of four. And you can see here, if you know the Mishnah, the Mishnah has the, um, the earliest attested form of the Passover, the four questions. And the Mishnah asks this question um, about why we eat meat this way. And the answer is um, because we used to we eat roast meat in the temple, and from that we conclude that the Mishnah, which is Mishnah Pesachim, um, was written at the time that the temple was still standing. Now, um, obviously, the temple after the destruction of the temple in the in the first century, that question um, came to be an irrelevance, and so it was lost to the wider tradition of Passover Haggadah, and also it was probably never used in Babylon because they didn't. The temple was not central to the Jews of Iraq. And it's the, the customs of the Jews of Iraq, which eventually became the customs of the Jewish world. And so that question is never, never occurs in the Passover Haggadah today. And yet we find here in this copy from probably 10th or 11th century, written on parchment, a lovely, lovely copy of the, of the Passover Haggadah, you can see the question as it is adapted to 10th or 11th century Egypt. So the temple no longer stands, but they still ask the question. Um, uh, so why is it that on any other night we eat meat that's either stewed or boiled or roasted? Um, and on this night, you know, we, we eat only roast meat because, because we used to eat roasted meat in the temple. And this is their way of kind of adapting to the destruction of the temple, that they still celebrate the temple through this question, and they celebrate the, the Palestinian tradition of Judaism through having this form of the Passover Haggadah, but they have to make it a past tense because the temple hasn't stood for nearly a thousand years. And eventually, of course, this drops out altogether. Um, strange things are preserved in the Geniza that you wouldn't expect. So here is a, a book of Yanai's poetry. So one of the great um, early um, poets of the Palestinian school, 
Um, he wrote um, liturgical poetry to be sung in the synagogue when people read the Bible through, went, read the Torah through, and it and it and it's written according to the three and three and a half year cycle. So the bits of of the Bible that it celebrates are not those that are read in the standard one year reading tradition today. Um, but this was written possibly ninth or tenth century. It's not entirely clear when this copy of the of these poems was produced, but it was a period, period before paper was available and at a time when parchment was still expensive. And so if you wrote a book, you might try and reuse other, um, other pages from older books. And this is called a palimpsest. And in this case, the Jewish scribe has reused a copy of a book that came from a Christian monastery that somehow came onto the market and he has acquired. And it just happens to preserve a lost work of the early Christian church, Oregon's Hexapla, which is a, a, a a fabled, almost legendary work. It definitely existed, but no copies of it exist today. Um, a critical edition of the of the Hebrew Bible in in its Greek translations, written in six columns by the Church Father Oregon, and this is an early copy of it from the fifth or sixth century um, that has been cleaned, uh, washed, and then reused to write a book of Hebrew poetry. Now, the nature of the of, of the Geniza is that that things always change anyway. So Yanai. Yanai's poetry was used here to, to efface a manuscript from a Christian monastery that was probably destroyed anyway. Um, and that's why its books came onto the market. But at a certain point, no one read the poetry of Yanai anymore. And so beautiful books of Yanai's poetry were then given to children to practice their writing on. So here you have a lovely parchment page of again, a 10th or 11th century copy of uh, Yanai's poetry and a child has scribbled Hebrew characters all over it. Okay, I'm going to skip the last one, and I think I'll move on to questions. Well, thank you very much, Ben, for uh, the most wonderful talk. Um, yes, if you have any questions, please do type them in the chat at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I think we have one from Emil. He's asking about the relationship between uh, Maimonides and the Jews of Egypt with the Gaons of Babylonia. Well, um, the relationship uh, was was very close. Um, I mean, before Maimonides, um, there was, well, to be honest, we're still discovering the history exactly of how the Jewish community worked in Egypt because we're piecing it together bit by bit from documents because we did not know very much at all about the history of Jews of Egypt and Palestine in the Middle Ages until the discovery of the Karaganese. This is one of the great things about the Karaganiza, but it does mean that history has to be written from now, from the primary sources. So you find a letter here, a letter there, and you piece it together. There are no works of history produced by Jews in the Middle Ages that really cover the period that we're talking about, um, other than Sefer um, which is more, uh, which is slightly unreliable. Um, so the Jews of Egypt were divided into two mainly, between the Palestinian Jews and the Babylonian Jews, and the Babylonian Jews recognised that their, their spiritual leaders were in Iraq. And so they sent letters to Haiga on and Saadia and people like that. And we have their replies back. So we have letters in the collection, in the handwriting of Haiga on, Shiraga on, Shmuel ben Chofni. We don't have any that we know in the copy, in the handwriting Saadia go on, but it's only a matter of time because he must have sent letters to Egypt and we must have them, but we just don't know what his handwriting looked like, um, which is terrible because this would be a great find, equivalent to Maimonides. Um, so there was a strong connection and it was conducted almost entirely by letter. It's quite amazing how they managed to keep, uh, how the Jews of uh, the Geonim in Iraq managed to run the Jewish community in Egypt by letter alone. They had local representatives. There was a head of the Jews in Egypt who, rep who, who represented the Iraqi Jews, just as there was one from who represented the Palestinian Jews. Now, when Maimonides came and Maimonides was such a great figure, um, there had already been a severance between Egypt and the rest of the Jewish world to the east because of the Crusades and because of the decline of the, um, of the Abbasid Caliphate and of the Fatimid Caliphate, um, the, 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 the world was changing. And so the Jews of Egypt had to stand on their own feet. They no longer looked to Jerusalem or to Baghdad for their leadership. They had their own leader and they had the greatest leader of all time. They had Maimonides. And so they became more or less a kind of self-governing entity um, unfortunately, so much of it was invested in Maimonides, and when Maimonides went and you know, his, his, the rest of his family, 
um, after him, um, they no longer really, they, they never returned to the heights that they had had in the Middle Ages. Um, but for you know, many reasons, uh, the plague badly affected Egypt, for instance. Um, very, you know, the invasions of the different, and, uh, I mean, it, politics and religion, it's all mixed up. <laughs> Question from Vivian. Um, she believes that the name Rumani is written on the door to the Geniza. Um, do you have any idea what this is all about? No, but there, there are artifacts from the synagogue itself. Um, I think the door of the synagogue may be in the Walters Art Museum. And the Walters Art Museum's entire collection is online. So if you go to the Walters Art Museum website, which is fantastic, and they've made their entire collection open source and anyone can download and use it, you can see there, I think, I think it's there, yes, um, some carvings with names on from the Geniza. So that, that is the place to look. I'm afraid I don't know. Okay, well, uh, that's, it's no surprise that Vivian's surname is Romani. That's why she asked the question. <laughs> um, we have a question uh, about, uh, is, are there any documents from the Geniza still in Cairo? Perhaps you can talk about how, how some documents ended up in, in, in the States and some in Oxford. And Yeah, so, so I mean, it's a very, you know, in these, in, <laughs> I mean, as a librarian, um, you know, we have to be very careful um, in this post-colonial era to talk about discovering things. You know, Schechter discovered the Karaganiza, but the Jews, of, the Jews of Egypt had known about it for a thousand years. I mean, they'd been putting things into it, but he brought it to the attention of the world. But he wasn't the first to do it. Many people had visited Egypt, had been to the synagogue. The synagogue was a famed ancient synagogue. Um, when, especially in the 18th and 19th centuries, when Egypt became, um, rediscovered the pyramids and the, uh, the, the biblical history of, you know, the, the, the story of the pyramids and the Bible began to, to reach the wider world. Um, people came through Egypt and, and as well as looking at temples and looking at pyramids, they went to see the Cairo Geniza. And many of them took away manuscripts. And it's those manuscripts that were circulating in the in the in the Western in, in among Western book dealers that really brought the Geniza to the attention of scholars. Now, up to that point, up to the point that Schechter found the book of Ben Sira, nobody had really taken it seriously because a lot of the manuscripts that they had seen from Egypt had been what they regarded as uninteresting. Today we regard them as gold dust. So so things like the the um, letters between just two ordinary people, you know, the invitation to the lecture, um, marriage deeds and divorce deeds, that kind of thing, um, you know, history thrives on that today. But in Schechter's day, people weren't interested in ordinary people. They weren't even that interested in Maimonides. They were interested in discovering the ancient works of Judaism. And many of them were Christian scholars who were interested in discovering, you know, what this tells us about the story of Christ, you know, and, 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 and the rabbis at the time of Jesus. So, the focus was very different. So people went to Cairo and they took away manuscripts, but they, they, they didn't appreciate the, the, the bulk of what they had. Now, when Schechter went, he was not the first to take away a huge number of manuscripts. Um, other other, other um, Jewish collectors had been before him. Elkan Nathan Adler, the brother of the chief rabbi of England, had been and taken away 50,000 manuscripts, which are now in New York. Um, but when Schechter went, he decided that there was so much there that potentially is important, he couldn't sort it out while he was there. Um, so he decided to just take away, and he asked the chief rabbi, you know, can I take away things? And the chief rabbi of Egypt um, said, take whatever you like. Um, and and Schechter says in his article, I liked all. So he took away 200,000 fragments and brought them back to England. But he, you know, I think he didn't regard a lot of that as very interesting. He wasn't interested in the ordinary history of Jews from the Middle Ages, for sure. He was interested in the book of Ben Sirah and lost Midrashim. Um, and although the collection was in Cambridge from the 1890s and in other institutions too, um, a lot of it was just ignored. And during the long period of time that it was ignored, it was um, at times Cambridge University Library was going to burn the collection because they didn't feel there was anything useful to be found there. And it was only in the 1960s when a, a, an Israeli scholar called Goitain, S.D. Goitain, 
who wrote this amazing five volume work called a Mediterranean society. He came after he was in Budapest looking at manuscripts there and they said to him, Oh, if you're interested in manuscripts like this, Cambridge has loads. So he came to Cambridge and while he was working on Geniza documents in Cambridge, the librarian of the library then um, walked past him and said, well, you know, we have loads more of those out the back in boxes. And they were in the same boxes that Solomon Shepherd shipped them back to Cambridge. <laughs> um, and nobody had really disturbed them because they were written in esoteric languages like Arabic in Hebrew characters, which um, most, well, no scholars in Cambridge could read for sure. I mean, Schechter was a great, great scholar. I mean, he made the amazing discovery of Ben Sira, but he didn't read Arabic because that was not within his skill set of, you know, what medieval Judaism was. And yet we now know that 90% of the world's Jews in the Middle Ages lived in Arabic speaking in, in Islamic countries, mostly Arabic speaking. It was, you know, if you, if you wanted to be a scholar in the Middle Ages, you had to speak Arabic. Um, when when um, Ashkenazi Jews turned up, so following the Crusades, when French Jews turned up in Egypt, you know, escaping, and English Jews too, Norman Jews leaving, leaving England, turned up in Egypt, um, they might have been great scholars in their own countries, but because they didn't speak Arabic, they couldn't even sit in the court. Um, you know, they were regarded as barbarians and uncivilized. But anyway, I'm sort of getting off the point. But <laughs> the importance of Arabic speaking Judaism. And so when Goitain was shown that there were more manuscripts, he reached in and he pulled out a document and he says, and Goitain has a great sort of flair for telling stories, but he said it was about the, the Jewish trade with India, which was hitherto really unknown. And he said, you're sitting on a gold mine here. This is, this is you know, economic history, the primary sources for our whole economy of the Middle Ages, just here, lying around in boxes, unloved. And so my predecessor, Stefan Reif, was appointed in the 1970s to um, sort out the Cairo Geniza and, you know, make it available to scholarship. And he raised a lot of money and he, he, he took things out of the cases and he got it all conserved. And now it is, we're in a much better situation, thanks to him. Um, more recently, and I noticed somebody asked this, we did, we received a million pounds from a, a very generous donor in Canada um, called um, Dolph Friedberg, who paid for us to digitize the entire collection. So we have digitized the entire Cambridge collection. Um, and he actually went on and digitized all of the Geniza collections worldwide. And if, although if you go on our, if you go on the university library website, you will see we only have a, about 10% of the collection online. That's because we are slowly putting it online when we've described it, because we didn't feel there was any point in pouring 200,000 manuscripts with no way of navigating, no information about them. But if you go to the Friedberg website, or, or soon if you go to the National Library of Israel website, you will see the whole Geniza, and you can look at any of the fragments that you like. Um, but I warn you, I mean, it's, there are, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of them. It's a lifetime's work. There's a question about medical related fragments and are there other subject orient, uh, oriented research? Um, yeah. Yes. So, so yeah, so, so, I mean, famously, um, um, Yehezgal Isaacs, who was a um, Iraqi Jewish doctor, and he was a GP in England. Um, when he retired, he came and worked with Stefan Reif. And because he could read Arabic, um, he was able to read doctor's handwriting from the Middle Ages, which is, you know, Arabic handwriting in the Middle Ages is pretty tricky anyway, but Arabic, you know, Arabic writing by doctors, like Maimonides, is almost impossible. And he wrote a catalog of uh, about 2000 items. Because again, again, our knowledge of medicine in the Middle Ages is mostly derived from the theoretical works of medicine. So the, the, the works which, you know, tell you how you should treat people. We don't have many examples of how they actually treated people because it's all very well to get for Galen or Hippocrates to say you should do this. But, you know, a, 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 a physician in Egypt might not have access to half of the materials required um, they may draw upon other sources of knowledge, folk medicine and tradition and so on. And so what we have in the Geniza are alongside pages from Hippocrates and Galen. We can see that Maimonides used Galen, for instance, like um, the rest of the, uh, of, the, of the civilized world. You know, Galen was the great, the great physician. Um, but we can see from their prescriptions and from their lists of ingredients and from their, their um, recipes for drugs, that they, are, they, they used all manner of sources and materials and techniques to treat illness. And we can also see what kind of illnesses they, you know, people suffered a lot from lung diseases and eye problems in Egypt.
for instance, as, as you might expect. Um, other subject-oriented research, we're particularly interested in the moment in the Bible, although it's, it's really, I mean, there are, there are, I mean, the India trade has been looked at. I have colleagues who are working specifically on Maimonides and his circle of scholars, so not just the man himself, but the people around Maimonides. We, find, we found, for instance, um, the lecture notes of people who attended Maimonides' lectures. So as good as being in the room with Maimonides, almost, you have the notes of students who were in the room with Maimonides. Um, but we have a great interest at the moment in the Bible because, as you saw from that copy of the Bible written in Arabic script, one of the great um, things about the Geniza that can help us really is to establish how Hebrew was pronounced in the Middle Ages. And that's of particular interest because we know that we're pronouncing it wrong today. Um, this is not how you're supposed to pronounce it. And we can recover the reading tradition from the people who were very close to when it, the vowels were first invented and it was first written down. Well, we actually have the son of Haskell Isaacs on, on this call, That's right. um, yeah. which is uh, amazing, but not so amazing because it's a small world. And we've just asked <laughs> if, he, if he wants to speak and recount any <laughs> stories. I'm waiting to, to get a reply. <laughs> OK, and um, there was one question from Sarah about how did they manage to write so uh, evenly and in such a level way? Uh, uh, do you have any idea? Yeah, we we do again. Um, uh, well, there, I mean, there 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 are two ways. So, um, if you look at some of those manuscripts on parchment, you'll see. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll be brief. I could go on and on about how they write lines. It's ridiculous. Um, but 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 if you look how they write parchment, like copies of the Bible, they will, will they will prick lines of holes down the side. And if you look closely at some of those images I had, you'll see the holes. And then they drew lines, or they scraped lines with hard points. Um, so you can't today necessarily see the line, but they could when they did it. And the other way they did it is they used a, um, a mastera. So they used a, a writing board, which was a board with strings on it. And you put your paper on it and you rubbed it over and it left faint impressions. And then you, you use that. And again, those lines don't necessarily survive a thousand years. So it looks like they're, they're doing it by eye. But in fact, they're doing it, you know, using ancient techniques. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, David, do you want to share any of your father's experience with us or your knowledge of what your father was doing? <laughs> uh, well, he, was, he yeah, um, I mean, he, as Ben said, he, he was a GP in uh, Manchester before he moved to Cambridge and he was invited by Stefan Reif to um, uh, work on the um, medical fragments and he had a PhD in Manchester University uh, in um, Judeo-Arabic, so he was, and he was from Iraq um, originally. So um, yeah, qualified in in um, all these different areas, in, in medicine and Judeo-Arabic, and, and being a, a, a native of Iraq, uh, all sort of blended perfectly for his retirement in Cambridge. Uh, and it was a great, uh, great blessing that his um, uh, book, the uh, uh, which is a foundation research volume of the um, a sort of a, uh, an academic uh, text of the fragments for other scholars to use, it was published just before he passed away in 1994. Um, so it was a great part of his life, really. Um, and it's in, the works have since been carried on by an Israeli pro uh, professor, I think, who is uh, who's using uh, my dad's. Um, research. But I mean, I think the other thing I was going to say is, I know it's difficult at the moment in the current circumstances, but shouldn't this um, uh, uh, be uh, uh, um, in, um, publicised in or, or promoted in schools here in the UK? I mean, we, we seem to be having a sort of neurotic fit of multiculturalism at the moment. Uh, and um, here's something that will show show, show um, other people of something of Jewish history, that the, you know, the, the Jews in the Middle East. Um, and I think as Ben said, 90% of, of the Jews in the Middle Ages were um, living in Arabic speaking countries or the, the Islamic world. Um, yeah. And I think, yeah, that is hugely significant. Uh, and, that, and the, the Geniza is a very important part of that story. In fact, it's vital. Well, this is something which uh, Harif is trying to do, obviously. Yes. Uh, yes, promote our history. 
uh, to the outside world. Uh, just just Doreen, Doreen wants to point out that uh, your father and your mother met at her brother's bar mitzvah. <laughs> it's one of those little Jewish geography uh, tidbits. <laughs> um, last question, I think. Um, is the Geniza the medieval equivalent of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Ooh. I don't know if you can answer Ooh. that. I was hoping we would get through the whole evening without mentioning the Dead Sea Scrolls. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's, sometimes I, I, try, it's, I, I sort of begin my first slide saying there are great collections, you know, there's the Dead Sea Scrolls, there's Oxyrhynchus, there's this, but the Geniza dwarfs them all. It is the medieval equivalent of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but it's different because the Dead Sea Scrolls um, really, although the origins of the Dead Sea Scrolls are still, you know, subject to debate, but they really um, give us a, a glimpse of a particular part of Judaism that may not have been mainstream at a particular time. Whereas what you get with the Geniza is you get almost the whole Jewish world. So it's, you know, it's not just Palestinian Jews and Iraqi Jews. Um, you have Karaites. You know, Karaites were anathema at that time. You know, Maimonides and, and, and Sadia attacked Karaites and so on. And yet we have their manuscripts in the collection. Um, we have Christian manuscripts. We have Islamic manuscripts. We have, you know, the entire kind of medieval world has somehow fallen into this chamber. And you just don't get that with the Dead Sea Scrolls. I admit that the Dead Sea Scrolls are becoming increasingly interesting. Um, but, but they give you... I think they might give you a skew version of what the world was like at that time. Whereas I feel with the Geniza, that you're getting a very balanced view. Well, I think on that note, we will wrap up. I know you're, you're, um, you're ready to celebrate your daughter's um, birthday. And so we won't hold you up any longer. I'm sure you're getting very hungry in the Uthwaite household. So uh, many, many thanks for doing this especially on on your daughter's birthday and um and thank you for a most fascinating talk and of course the uh the complimentary uh, comments in the in the chat testify to the fact everyone agrees with me thank you very much indeed thank you very much i'm uh, just going to mute everyone so they can all sing happy birthday to your daughter or say thank you <laughs>